So we drew a line essentially on March 15th, it was like 2020, right? And that told the story. As you could see what those patterns looked like, we didn't need that many words on the page. Yeah, because, because it says it all in the, the visual did mm. it and it actually accomplished what that what that looks like. The reason that we were able to come up with that story is because of those three boxes that we just talked about. So understand the past, understand what we value, understand where we need to go. Then use the uh, understand the pattern that we can that we can <clears> discuss. So that that's what I find helpful. HR analytics is crucial for translating the people story into actionable insights that engage executives. By measuring the key performance indicators, HR professionals can demonstrate the impact of their initiatives on organizational success. Presenting this data visually helps decision makers make informed choices on hiring, training, and retention. HR analytics bridges the gap between the people's story and the company's strategic vision fostering a collaborative approach to managing human capital. On today's HR Leaders podcast, I'm joined by Jeremy Shapiro, who's the AVP of HR Workforce Analytics at Merck. During the episode, Jeremy shares how to tell your talent story through analytics. He talks about how to leverage talent analytics with senior leaders to drive better decisions. He talks about how to use analytics as a guide during volatility and uncertainty. And lastly, the role of ESG and public disclosures. As always, before we jump into the video, make sure you hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification bells, and follow on your favorite podcast platform. With that being said, let's jump in. Jeremy, welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you. You've got a serious background going on there. You've got pictures, ah. you've got your little... little uh, I, I, what, 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 what else? I've seen a picture of the family. What are some of the other things that like I'm seeing behind you on that on the table? Well, so this was a, I mean, th this is a, um, a sunroom that before the pandemic um, was too cold to go into. <laughs> and yet during the pandemic to make sure, so I've got, I got three daughters that are in, in high school and now in yeah. college. And um, I was like, All right, I need, I need a separate space. And so yeah. we found a way to make this, this kind of work. So this craft table was never in use beforehand and now turned into a uh, into a backdrop as well. But this is like every little piece of my life is somewhere. I, I in love here. it. So like my I'm a third generation baker and oh, okay. my dad used to work at this uh, chain for those in the U.S. would know uh, Dunkin Donuts. Well, no, he, we know it, too. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, right, right. Yeah. So yeah. he he was uh, he was one of the original when Dunkin Donuts used to make donuts in the stores. Freshly. I kind of grew up behind the bench. Of, oh, wow. Uh, of a, of a donut. So I've got an old effect right here. I have an old Dunkin Donuts mug. Oh, the old I'm school. not quite sure I'm supposed to have this, by the way. I like <laughs> <laughs> and is, that the old, is that the old logo as well? This is the old logo. This oh, is wow. like the 70s logo from, from Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, so there's this has like little pieces of both my life That's and cool. also Merck life as well. So this is like the history book of of Merck and and what we've done since so like since the 1800s inside of the inside of the organization um wow. too. So it's like little pieces of family and yeah. Life. I actually I found somewhere in my 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 mom's old papers at the house. Um, I had an elementary school um, science test uh, <laughs> that was apparently a qualifier to do a Merck program. I'm like, oh, I, had, wow. I forgot that that was even the thing. <laughs> so there's these interesting little intersections cool. too, that they're all it's all part of the backdrop. Yeah, I love those kind of moments in history that you keep. Like really random though, to bring yeah. this up, but I'm going to say it anyway. Like um, my, um, I, I was in the loft of my nan's house recently, uh -huh, uh -huh. and uh, she had all sorts of things just stored away. And yeah. I found a book, a binder that was like huge, thick. Yeah. And what it was, it was how to use a telephone. Oh, I love it! And it was a massive binder, like it was like That's hundreds awesome. and hundreds and hundreds of pages. Oh, and, and it was just a normal phone, like a, a, a old school, like, you know, what do you call them where you spin it? Yeah. What yeah, other yeah, one are called? The you, know, you know, the yeah. ro rotary phone. Yeah, rotary phone. And it was a guide, like a huge guide about what, what, is, a, what is a phone? How does it work? How do yep. you do it? And I was like, of yep. course, you needed that back then. It just made me laugh when I saw it. it was you know, a... it's so funny you bring that up. This is not my story, but, but someone, I remember someone uh, making this observation on stage at a conference like a million and a half years ago. 
is he 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 talked about w- growing up in a um in his father's hardware store mm-hmm. and his grandfather worked there and, and when they first got a computer the the grandfather needed the big binder sure yeah yeah, yeah. Figure out how to use the how to use the computer but he in the store was just like yeah that's how you're supposed to how you're supposed to do things of course. then when they when they got a uh when they got their next piece of equipment the dad needed the binder and you know he was like, well, this is just kind of normal. And <laughs> yeah, and the the basic the, the baseline of the story is essentially when you grow up with the tech, you don't need the binder, right? Is it's the, so is true. That notion for it too. So the question is for you and I, what's our binder? Ooh, interesting. Oh, right. Yeah. Is, and and like what what our is it binder that is YouTube? Generation? My binder is YouTube. Like yeah, I like I don't have a physical binder, but you know, for example, I'm learning about live stream production, how to. Uh, use our new switcher that we our broadcast switcher. Right, and my yeah, binder yeah. is YouTube videos, yeah, and audio yeah. and audio books. And right, I've, the medium's changed. I the think the medium has changed. The medium, but changed. there's always a topic that we have to learn that the digital natives, or at least the next natives. Yeah, what's the next version of that? We we would need. So for for me, it's how to use Snapchat and TikTok, <laughs> um, to, even to communicate to my kids. Yeah, so you and, understand uh, the with, context. With with my three with with my three girls, if I actually want them to reply to something, I send a Snapchat. <laughs> oh, because <laughs> like you a, know, that's, yeah, you, that's that's the way to get. That's to what them needs to do with businesses, like, right? As well, like right. Yeah. Like I always say to businesses, why are you trying to drag everyone into your intranet? No one cares. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Get on YouTube, Spotify. You know, get on the uh, SoundCloud. Uh, like, get on all of the places that they already exist. Um, right. I was doing some uh, DHL and if Lindsay's listening, uh, I, I always shout her out. She's doing Lindsay Bridges over at DHL, one of the HR leaders. She has a, their own okay. internal podcast mm. and they publish it across all of the major platforms rather than cool. keeping it internally. Whether you're yeah. a customer or someone thinking about working at DHL, you publish it on yeah. LinkedIn and uh, it's such an amazing way for to connect with people uh, rather than yeah. trying to drag them to you go to them yeah yeah um yeah one of the things that freaks me out though a little bit is like my, my daughter's four uh robin and she's got yeah. a, a little uh, amazon tablet that she plays games uh-huh. on and uh she said to me yesterday i was like you need to eat your dinner and she's like daddy i'm just installing the new updates so i'll be there in a minute <laughs> i was like what <laughs> and i was I was like, what? She's like, yeah, I'm just, she's like, I just got to run the updates for Roblox. She plays Roblox. And then she said to me, um, which again, I just can't even believe I'm having a conversation um, with a four-year-old about it. She said, oh, no, we're on the wrong server. We've got to move over to the EU server because we're on the North American server, daddy. What? What the that heck? That's insane. Awesome. She's four. That's awesome. And like... Yeah, anyways. <laughs> Stop it. Anyway, we went off on a bit of a tangent there, but it's a, good, a cool way to start the episode. Tell everyone a bit yeah. more about you, you know, your journey, your background sure. to, to where we are now. Yeah. yeah so I um the, I, I had kind of an unexpected journey, and I don't mind that as well, like zero regret. So, you know, the 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 whole idea of growing up behind a bakery counter um taught me a few things growing up. Um, to, one is maybe don't don't have a job where I'm working forty hour weekends. So, so that was <laughs> that was one. Hard. like where, yeah. uh, the, one of the and that 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 work ethic has served me really well too. The so like I don't mind working the hours that my father would work. So like he would regularly wake up at two in the morning. Yeah, because you got to prepare. My friend's uh, dad would owned a bakery. Donuts. My friend's dad owned a bakery, and he yeah. would work. And he would get up at 2 a.m. to get all of the things baked and everything. So when the shop yeah. opens, it's yep, already yep. crazy. They're open at 6 a.m. You need to have everything. That's you know, crazy. You, you need to be frying off donuts at about 4 a.m. in order to make a 6 a.m. You know, kind of kind of work, too. So it turns out that my best writing time now, even, is 4 in the morning. No way. <laughs> and I'm conditions. pretty sure that's because of the, this kind of bakery, yeah. you know, bakery work. But so that that was kind of where, where, I, uh, uh, where, where, I, where I kind of started. And I think where I learned about the world of work was behind a, was behind a counter, um, work you know, kind of trying to understand and meeting needs and understanding. I mean, you know, donuts and rolls a little bit different than analytics, but in some <laughs> ways not. We could we could we could explore that. Sure there's a deep psychological thing there too. Um, but I, I got a degree at, at Rutgers University in in economics and history, um, and then you know I, I so I started out working right as the internet was popping. 
um, to like that 94, 95 mm-hmm. uh, um, time. And of course, I'm, I'm energized by this new thing. This is pretty cool. Somehow, um, I landed uh, a role in um, in an Omnicom advertising agency that focused on, focused on recruitment. What did you study, by the way? Sorry. What did you study? Oh, so it was, econ- it was economics. Okay, cool. cool. Um, and I did a little bit of work with economics, right, you know, kind of as freelance before, before landing a job. But the... In this in this role, one there was no there was no such a, a such title even as a web developer um, at that yeah. point. And it was the, yeah. like, they they were running a site that was called Career Mosaic, which it was a competitor to Monster and to all those kind of oh. the first generation of of online recruitment. And somehow, I got to work on the first generation of career websites. Interesting. So that kind of initial move from paper to wow. um, to to online for like really big companies. One of them was Shearing Plow, which Merck then acquired. Yeah. I'm sitting in one of the offices that I saw a couple decades ago mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, on in in doing that work. But what was really cool about that is it was the first time um, that HR had consistent recruitment data. Um, that you could easily access. Mm-hmm. Too. In prior years, you could do something, but it was really hard to kind of yeah. try to understand the effectiveness for for all of that as well. And so we started using data, working with really big clients to try to understand how do you optimize your recruitment and so forth. And at that point, that was like revolutionary to them. They'd never seen that type of that that type of data um, um, before. And so that that's where I started growing my network and trying to understand how do you. How do we best use technology for um, for for an HR purpose? Um, so, well. so, was all yeah. of your skills around your technical skills around people analytics acquired along that journey? Then it's not something you it, studied. That that's where it started. So, I it really did start there, just sitting down with recruitment. I was learning recruitment at that same time and trying to understand how can we apply this new tech mm. to um, to to the recruiting industry. Things that are um, pretty standard today. We were inventing the language of back then. It was like me and three other people at, at a couple of companies <laughs> that were trying to figure out how to how to do that. And the the oddest part for me was now in retrospect, being 20, 22, 23 years old, working with giant companies like I was in GE at Crotonville, like the at, really mm. at the height of their of their of their work, teaching them how to use the internet to recruit. Crazy. Right, that was pretty cool. That was that, that was almost a like fun, ahead. Like, it was almost like ahead of your t- head at the time. It, it really, I mean, it, in some ways, it was. I it, I must have come off as precocious. <laughs> right? like, what and, are you, and, and I think about that now, yeah. like, oh, I would have never done that like that. You know, how, what was the like? I wonder, like back then, what was the? Uh, how was that received from leadership back then? Were they like, ah, this is not important? Like, what, 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 what? Like, I'm just interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, well, it depends. So some some organizations. So, so like if GE at that point had had gone all in. So Jack Welch, it was mm-hmm. the, that was the Jack Welch Bill Connolly period too, which is really the apex of some of their HR progressive thinking. And it was quite um, cutthroat, though, wasn't it? It it was. It was. I mean, it. it I think it was Jack Jack Welch's uh, um, uh, mandate. Everything's got to get online when GE. Oh, that's good though. Okay, great. Like, like literally came in and then we we were we were already there saying, hey, you know, we've already built this for you. So would you like to use this for recruitment? They're like, yes, let's go and perfect. Let's go and do that. But I mean, that that was a the thing that I think HR still to this day um feels sometimes is that they're not the early adopters of some of some types of tech. And I feel the opposite. I think they're they actually are the earliest adopters of some tech, particularly in recruiting, because they want what works. Yeah. You know, and so even that early on, you wouldn't expect that, let's say, healthcare would have been early adopters. But healthcare recruiting tends to want to use anything that's going to get nurses in the door. (laughs) And high volume. They'll use it. (laughs) High volume as well, right? (laughs) Yeah, 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 exactly. So like, so they, they, you, you found that all over the place that, um, that you would, you would see great adoption of, yeah. of technology in in those. How does it make you days. feel? How does it make you feel from where you are there to see where we are now? It well, one, I think it's it's a. I'm so proud of where HR has come 
in the past, you know, in the, in the past couple decades, really. Um, too. So like a- after that, I was at Morgan Stanley for about nine years doing this type of stuff than mm-hmm. here. But if I look back, um, some things haven't changed too much, but other things are 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 just light years ahead. When we started this journey, um, just the idea of analytics inside of HR, people would squint at you like, "What? one, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> yeah. Two, why would I invest in that? It was really the case for change uh, type yeah. of type of work. And then if you look at it today, and you you know it from, from your podcast uh, too, is people coming out of school today are looking at people analytics as a career. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, that that really is amazing. There's now a shortage. That's, that's There's a amazing. huge shortage of of talent and people in this space. You know, uh, I sh- I would have said shortage prior to the pandemic. And I, th- I feel like over the past three years, oh, uh, a yeah. lot of amazing talent has shifted and said, I, I want to use my industrial and organizational psychology different parts knowledge, of the or business. I want to use my data science knowledge yeah. mm-hmm. in this way. And 100%. that's attractive to me. Yeah. You know, enough that that I had to, it was, at first it was a double take for me. Are you sure <laughs> you want that? <laughs> because there are some really great ways you can go in marketing or in sales um, or operations or, yeah. or supply chain I mean, or everywhere else. <laughs> and in our organization, so look, we, we employ a lot of scientists. And so if you say data scientist, we, we mean it. <laughs> We we Literally. need that second word <laughs> yeah, yeah. deeply, and so you know there are so many different avenues that you could go in. Yeah. I, I, to me, it's it's um, it's both enriching and um, and it just fuels me to want to help even even more. So like every moment that I can help somebody um, explore their career, I'm in. Like let's nice. let's go let's go do it. One of the things I'm interested in doing, it kind of aligns quite nicely. As I mentioned, we just got back from our event at Lego where half the yeah. room was people analytics, VPs, directors, and the other half of the room was CHROs. And that was the plan. Nice. It's really interesting to have those two groups together. Yeah. Many of the CHROs came with their counterpart in people analytics, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, amazing. Yeah. That, even yeah. that alone is was like, my brain was like, cool. we've come a long way <laughs> uh, si- since then. So I want to jump into some of yeah. the questions that we kind of, yeah, of got from them and some of the wow. kind of challenges, which are really in line with what our original conversation was uh, structured around. So firstly, you know, how do you tell your talent story through analytics? I think it's a big challenge that many companies face. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I find it helpful um, to start with um, understanding patterns and then... Begin, being, beginning to craft your story in an iterative fashion. So what do I mean by that? Is I need to understand the space that I'm working in. So, you know, in, in coming to, so I'm only four years at Merck, right? So the first thing I needed to do was try to understand the organization's roots and what its history might look like and how, and that that might come from a, a bunch of places looking at some of the longitudinal data. So it's very it's very fortunate this this particular organization has had some type of analytics function for a long time. In different, you know, different eras that showed up a little differently, but the data was there. And so you can kind of see where they came from. We actually have a slide of diverse representation at this company that's that's over 50 years. Really? You can actually see female management representation wow. increase and the, the ski slope upwards of this company over over that time. So for me, being able to understand what space we're dealing with, you know, kind of culturally. So before you look to the so, so before you look forward, you need to look to the past. Yes. Yeah. To at least understand a bit of the roots. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of at least at least understand a bit psychologically and culturally. Where are they at? Okay. What is the what what is their what is their typical pattern of turnover by segment of of type of value added function that um, that's going on? How do we think about recruiting and who do we recruit? So in pharmaceuticals, you see a slightly older um, profile of of uh, of an employee because we have so many PhDs and MDs. You know, you don't get a P unless you're you know a child genius. You're not getting a PhD or an MD at twenty one. Um, versus if you're in financial services, it actually skews towards the kind of you know kind of post undergrad as your as your base with. So the profiles of the organizations always change. That's your starting point. 
know, that, that's how I like to understand and and try to absorb as, as quickly as possible. It's from there that you start listening and telling stories. You know, so I always feel like understand the box, then understand organizational principles. Kind of what is it? You know, how what do we value? What are the what are the obligations that we have to our constituents, to each one of our stakeholders? So for us, that would be our patients, our customers, our employee base, our investors, um, you know, and kind of the communities at large. As as we understand those dimensions, that's what fuels me to tell stories. Because now I know what's important and I know who we are as an organization. I'll then link that to the third to the, to the third item, which is where do we want to go next? Mm-hmm. Once you have those elements, you can you can actually it's not that hard to tell data driven stories with uh, with with each one of these things. So during the pandemic, um, obviously, you know, you, you've you've had you've had lots of conversations about this too. I'm trying to forget most of the things that we, we did during <laughs> the pandemic, yeah. but one of the things that we did is we we had four longitudinal charts for the board and we showed them what employee engagement looked like over time what badge swipe data looked like over time Um, we had four different dimensions what recruiting looked like over time and then we just drew a giant line that was the kind of well i get so not sure when you publish this we're now like two days from the third anniversary of at least in the United States where they declared pandemic and everyone stayed home for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so we drew a line essentially on March 15th it was a 2020. Right. And that told the story because you could see what those patterns look like. We didn't need that many words on the page. Yeah. Cause because it says it all in the, the visual did mm-hmm. it and it actually accomplished what that, what that looks like. The reason that we were able to come up with that story is because of those three boxes that we just talked about. So understand the past, understand what we value, understand where we need to go. Then use the uh, understand the pattern that we can that we can discuss. So that that's what I find helpful. Yeah. So the way you present it again, you know, you don't need fifty slides. <laughs> Keep it simple. You know, like you said, you didn't even need to have any words. It said it all in yeah. the chart. <laughs> yeah. That you share. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Like. The the my operating assumption is that um, fewer words are better, and the more visual you can tell that story, the better the better it is. So when we work with even our analysts too, something that we we ask them to do inside their this is their inside voice, not not outside voice, is um, as you're starting your story, do it do it like a fairy tale. Start your story like a fairy tale. Once okay. upon a time, it's the beginning, you beginning, and you use that as a way to introduce what's going on, you know, kind of setting context immediately in storytelling is, is important. That's why once upon a time works. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is you're actually, you're literally centering them on a time, on a time basis and then going to chapter one. Like how many times have you looked at uh, uh, some type of data-driven story or non-data driven story? And it feels like they started in chapter three. Yeah, and you want to know I'm what like, happened in chapter one? Hundred percent. Like, well, yeah, this is great, yeah. but what's the context of, of that? Hundred percent. I've been there many times. Yeah. What do you see as the biggest challenge that pe- companies face typically when it comes to this? Uh, in, in in terms of uh, analytical storytelling, yeah, like of- what are the things that you you think you know? Don't do this <laughs> for our listeners right now. I'm sure you've 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 been there a million times. Oh, the hot like- list. Yeah. So the hot list of of uh, mistakes I made. Okay, so I totally can do this one. All right, so. Um, one, too many words. Yeah. Two, not setting context. So tell me where the beginning, tell, mm-hmm. tell me where the start of the story is. And the, th- the third is aligning it to business context. Yeah. So what kind of, uh, you've heard this before, but it's kind of the what, so what, now what, the nice way to abbreviate how to tell a, a data analytics story as well. And where do you, where do you put prescriptive action in, um, for for your audience to to understand that, I think that's that's a big that's a big hit. Here's one that I actually found that I thought was really helpful too. Is more and more we're using online systems to express the story, and so we try to go PowerPoint less. So we try not to use PowerPoint in most contexts. One thing that is not as commonly um, thought of though is this is the enemy, right? And so. Can the folks that are reviewing whatever you're reviewing, can they see it? 
Yeah, yeah, that's um, a good point. And I can almost I can almost tell if we're going to have a good conversation or a rough conversation if the the team that we're working with all has to put on their glasses. It's usually a sign that you can't tell your story. That's a, <laughs> never really thought about that way. You got to make even the small detail of making yep. sure. Love yep. it. I literally I worked with one CEO. He was scrolling through one of one of our one of our decks together. And he's like, this is great. I don't need to even need my glasses. And it was the best conversation. Later on, a year later, we did a, the similar conversation, put put the glasses on. And I was like, oh, what's gonna what's gonna happen? It's and it wasn't point, that good. Though. It was it was a, it's it's like a nice a, when you again you mentioned the, the childhood once upon a time, but it's, it's the way that they design kids' books. If you look at a child, if you like, obviously I read my, read to my daughter every night. They design yeah. the books in a way that you can see everything very clearly displayed and simple, and you, so you, obviously it's designed so a child can consume the information. I let's just, let's just make it simple. <laughs> All right. All right, Chris, we're going to have to write a book together. It's going to be the it's going to be a, a a childhood storytelling book about people on like data driven oh, HR analytics. Oh, that's got to be done, man. And that's and that's what, <laughs> send that to all of your leaders and your managers. Uh, that, that's actually a really good idea. <laughs> that's Love actually it. just someone's going to sit it now. Um, this kind of leads me good, uh, quite nicely to the next question is, and, and again, something that came up recently at the event is that yeah. how do you leverage talent analytics with senior leaders to drive better decisions? Yeah. You know, getting it in their hands, but allowing them to make their decision decisions, whether that be, you know, I'll, I'll just stop there. You, you get the question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So, if you're if, if you've been asked to run a function like this or you're a leader that's that's working on uh, um that's working in in this area um the first set of principles is what is the nature of the investment you're about to make right so most of the time hr analytics teams aren't building machines right so they they aren't building chatbots that will automate some process sometimes we, we do right but a, a lot of the work the end output is to influence a decision you need to gear the your entire organization to that objective. So if you've built an amazing analytical machine, but you struggle with um, with influencing or storytelling at the end, then the decision making process is going to struggle as well. So that's it's it's a signal that you just know you need to heavy up yeah. in, in understanding that the last thing you're going to do that is the most impactful is influence right so that that's the that's the start is just recognizing your question is that that is the value creation is i was going to decide this way and now i'm going to decide something else based on based on data so segment one segment two is um is alignment so the more that the analytical team the closer the analytical team is to business alignment the more effective they are how do you make you know, that happen so, in a practical sense? So how have you done that so in different companies you've two, worked in? Two, two things. One is ask for it. Simple. Just literally. Just say, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, like, just say, hey. I love it. You know, work, work, working with the CFO, I, I just need five minutes with you um, just to understand something. For, for our team, we tend to tape a lot of our uh, town halls um, for divisions and so forth. It's a pretty big company, right? So we're 69,000 people. And so a lot of it goes onto our webcasting portal too. Um, one of the assignments of everyone on our team is listen to the town halls of every one of our leaders so that they are getting and absorbing the same right. data points yeah. that uh, that that group might hear that everyone everyone else might not. So even if you're not working and covering that group, you should know what's going on inside of research or inside of manufacturing or inside of the inside of the marketing or kind of you know patient patient organizations. Um, because it just it makes you a, a stronger and better aligned, um, better aligned person. And the third thing I would suggest is um, is creating investment with the uh, with your end users, and I mean investment as mental time investment too. So, if you're telling a story, it might be very obvious what the answer is, right? But sometimes you don't want to tell the whole answer. You want to hold a little bit back to allow the the users and the, the the absorbers to do to do some of their work for them. Um, I find this very helpful because um, people are more apt 
to understand for themselves what the data is saying um, and act than if everything is completely served to them on yeah on otherwise the you're um, having to do a little work yeah you're, otherwise you're 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 taking away the opportunity from them you know in a, in a to, love that yes I yes explain it you know you know yeah you get what I mean <laughs> yeah yeah to- total in fact that that's a really nice framing Chris for that too it's very smart is is tr- is if you if you use a frame for yourself of what is it that I might be doing that that denies someone else an opportunity to learn? Yes, that's yeah, really yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. We talk about that a lot, even for our team. Of if you're in a meeting and you know an answer to a question, exactly. You don't have to answer. Let, let, exactly. <laughs> I, I make that mistake all the time. It's, and the reason yeah. I brought it up because I, as a leader, as a CEO, sometimes I actually. Um, I don't give people the opportunity to fail themselves and learn or, yeah. or do the work, yeah. like you're saying. And I realized that actually I'm taking away the opportunity for them to learn. Just because I have the answer doesn't mean I should say it. <laughs> um, I'd rather let people go away, figure it out, because then they learn something. Lo- uh, this is, that yeah. is a great, it's a great, great point. Um, you know, there is, there's a, a gentleman that just passed away. His name is uh, Dr. Ed Shine. And some some of the listeners might know him. Mm-hmm. This, he was this most prolific um, industrial and organizational psychologist. He was in his nineties and still writing with his wow. with his uh, son. I think was, was still writing writing books about about industrial organizational psychology, and influenced so many people in so many ways. It's really really cool. And he wrote this. He almost every one of his books was like the the size of Who Moved My Cheese, like re, like thin books. Oh, that's cool. One of them that really influenced me was called humble inquiry, and it was the it was the notion of um, when you're at at that point in your working day, working life, working career, where do you flip from um, answering questions to asking questions in a genuine way that that you're just kind of using curiosity as your as your starting point. For, for a lot of things and just trying to explore. It, it, that's, that really influenced me. Yeah, really no, I love that. That's a really good point you brought up. Um, one of the other things I want to love to, look, and kind of taking us back to the last couple of years that we've been through, actually, and to be honest, it's not like we're not out of a volatile environment. We're yeah, seeing yeah. banks fail. We're seeing all yeah. sorts of crazy things happening around us. How, what are some of the ways that you're using people analytics to guide the business, the organization during times of volatility? And yeah, uncertainty, because yeah. that was that was one of the interesting things about the pandemic. Is all of a sudden, all of the business leaders turned to HR and was like, "What do we do?" <laughs> yeah. And HR were just kind of pushed to the forefront, and people analytics was pushed to the forefront to help. Yeah, yeah. You know, interesting. I kind of wish that the pandemic was the end of that volatility. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's turning out I that know. that's not true. No, it's not. So if if we think about, so you're, I, you, I agree with your premise that life has, has increased its pace of volatility. And it's been, I've been thinking about this a little bit lately, is how do you manage the employee, uh, the employee experience or the HR experience in a way when you have um, such great change happening simultaneously, so whether it happens to be in in societal societal issues, in in the the war in Ukraine, um, so Silicon Valley Bank yeah. going under, then being saved, and then and and then you know Credit Suisse yesterday kind of had an they issue. They just got saved. So, yeah, I mean now, and let's take let's take recruiting. It probably wasn't that long ago that you were talking to to HR leaders about the Great Resignation, mm-hmm. and you're probably not having those conversations today. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very different. Well, what does that do to recruiting? So we, you know, for for let's say 18 months, they were essentially on a high competition pressure cooker like they've never seen before um, recruiting environment to one that's not relaxed, but it's different. A hundred percent. Yeah. To me, the only way through that is by by continually setting context through data. And so as, as we're even working with, with our leadership teams and our HR leadership teams, I do find that a lot of my time 
is spent resetting context. You know, what's what the story looks like today isn't necessarily the story that it looked like yesterday. How do you do so that? How we, is, it, is, it um, like, so, is, is it like a, is it like every meeting you start with? What's the context of today? Like how well, actually, practically no, how do we, you do we that? We do this. We we do this in two ways. One for our HR leadership meetings. Uh, we 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 start. This is the 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 our, our CHRO Steve Mizell is a wonderful wonderful leader, and he uh, he and I work together on starting each leadership meeting, just going through the data. Great. Okay. Great. We we, we tour we tour it live in systems. We don't. These aren't these aren't fancy decks. We literally go into the data set and say, look here. You know, I kind of give them my read on what's going on. They react and, and kind of are able to provide context or a different point of view for it. And that's what grounds us in in the remainder of the of the conversation, um, because it really does change the way that we operate when when that happens. The other thing that we tend to do and this, I think the modality for this, the, the delivery is different depending on the organization. But we're a research company. <laughs> we like white papers. Yeah. And so our team, our head of, of HR analytics research, she writes white papers about a s- specific topic, and that's how we get the message out. You're serving your, you're, you're serving it in a way that your audience likes to consume content, like we exactly. said earlier. Like yeah, we said earlier. Yeah. If we were an ad agency, I wouldn't use white papers. <laughs> yeah. I'd probably use something that that kind of more conformed with their of course. Uh, with with their work. It is funny though, because when I when when I was working in financial services, more of our more of our deliverables looked like you would see in a financial statement. Of course, yeah. And in, in pharmaceuticals, it looks more like a white paper. So the, the that modality might change a little bit, but that's that's how I'm finding the ability to to ground to ground it. We we just released a white paper last week about recruiting, and I think the headline of it was um, "Recruiting is um, is less tight, but." not relaxed. You know, it was kind of like one of those things of mm-hmm. it, you know, just just because we've come from intolerable heights down a little bit doesn't mean that that water isn't still hot and you might want to, you know, put a glove on before before putting your hand in it. Yeah. Um to I mean, you, you look at look at how quickly um folks that were laid off from from some of the Silicon Valley layoffs got jobs. You know, oh, some yeah. of, some of the data out was really fast. Was it in 90 days, 75% yeah, yeah. of the talent had a had a new job too, and I'm sure that'll be true of the latest announcement yesterday from Meta um, as well. Mm-hmm. These are really really skilled people. I think there's a bet that we're all making that as as the talent shifts, what that does to the to the startup environment and to some of the manufacturing environments, I think is a game changer. I think so. Really so cool. do you bring you know when you things like ex- external um, things happen? Do you, so you just yeah. do you bring them into the meetings? So for example. The cost of living right now, right? Totally. It, you know, inflation. Uh, if people, it's gone. You know, ten percent, probably even more than that, because <laughs> um, the data is always lagging, like yeah. a, year, a year behind, for, for, uh, yeah. at, um, at least as well. Uh, things like the bank collapsing, things like you know, we can keep going. So you bring those into those conversations. We do, yeah, yeah. In fact, I mean, I th- I find it helpful too because they just read it. Yeah, right. So it's it's top, it's top of mind. Yeah, and so because it's top of mind, you can link that to the internal story. So you may be worried, or you may, you know, articles sometimes create a hypothesis, and then you need to test that hypothesis quickly internally to see where the where where it's true and not true. So when the Great Resignation was a big was was a big theme, there are areas inside of our organization which that was true. There were other areas in our organization where that was not true. Our job is to use analytical, analytical thinking and, and data science digging mm-hmm. too. So we we have a, a methodology where across job codes and job families and, and even our value chain, we can see statistical anomalies like that. And so what we would then do is bring those statistical anomalies to leadership and say, yes, this is true, but in this way, but not in these other 10 ways. Love that. Helping to to focus our efforts and our and our time to you know, the, the 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 speed in which the internet can influence people's thinking is so fast. I mean, look, it took down a bank. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah, Twitter it, just took down a bank. You're right. And that's what people don't realize, right? It wasn't the fact that it was, yeah. it wasn't, it, that's what I was trying to explain to my, my wife the other day. I was like, it wasn't because of the bank. Yeah. I mean, yes, they were not doing, you know, they, they, they were heavily invested in, was it government, government, bond, not bonds, what do you call it? Uh, you know, the, the, yeah, the, the, there's a, there there the economist in me wants to comment on it, and then I I uh, will remind <laughs> well, it, them I'm not a practicing economist. Yeah, but so we're I'm not saying we're experts. But, but either way, the panic the panic of uh, people taking their money out was, was caused by social run. media. It was a uh, and, then, and run you saw other ba- it affected the share price of all the other banks yeah. um, as well. And now we're seeing a crazy situation where because the government have promised that those two banks are going to be covered by. Uh, the government that people are taking money out of their current stable banks and then putting it back into Silicon Valley Bank because they're like, well, the government's just promised <laughs> that, that this is going to be that you know, bulletproof. So it's crazy. Yeah. And you know, look, so the, for what you and I do on a day-to-day basis, our job is to set enough context internally so that employees, all of our constituents, employees, managers, leaders, investors mm-hmm. have the context for what's going on with our people in a, in a responsible way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause that, that's the other theme that that's been going on so heavily is as, um, as some of the ESG components are becoming a, a larger and Let's larger. Let's get into that. Let's get into that. Cause uh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. cause the, the role of ESG <laughs> and, and public disclosure, et cetera. Yeah. yeah I'm now seeing, Chief HR and CSR officers, and <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a, a big evolving yeah. space. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. So you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm both surprised and um, and uh, uh, pleasantly surprised, I would say, on where we're at today. So um, almost almost ten years ago, a, there was a group sponsored through some organizations to create. Human capital investor metrics, way too early. Mm-hmm. It was way, way, way too early. But it was fueled by some of the organizations that we're talking about right now. So SASB is this ESG organization. Um, and I got to work with them quite a bit on, on these topics. Um, the, there's been progress. This is like it, HR's, HR's contribution to ESG is an overnight success that took 10 years. <laughs> Right, it, it's it's still one of those one of those stories. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, investors. So I, this this is having worked in financial services. I got, but in HR, right? I got to I got to work a little bit on what is the what is the investor point of view on um, non strictly financial components. And one of the things that I learned from that is the the investors that have the greatest interest. Greatest, not zero interest, but the greatest interest are long horizon investors. That tends to be pension funds, um, government organizations that that are that are creating um, uh, um, those components, or or the the funds for insurance companies. These are folks that are investing over you know 10, 30, 40, yeah, even yeah. 50 year time horizons. And so they're incented to create good businesses. And so all of the ideas of triple bottom line of, you know, as you, as the, the stronger, the, the, the stronger your employee base is, the better you perform on the long horizon, that works out. If you happen to be working on a hedge fund that's doing high speed trading on a daily basis based on news articles, this is less on your mind, <laughs> yeah. right? Because yeah. the, the, da- the, the daily, the, the daily component is there today. The, um, Mainly because of some of the new regulatory frameworks that are that coming out. It, so yeah. the SEC um, writing that's now in effect, but you know, writing last year that um, human capital factors are an important part of you know are, are important an important part of materiality, and you should disclose them. You have to, right? Legally, um, no. You, well, here's the funny thing about this: is and a, a securities lawyer will do a better job, but from from the the interviews we've done with with folks at at some of the great law schools in this, mm-hmm. nothing actually changed, but okay. the emphasis on on uh, HR was just explicitly mentioned. So we as organizations were already on the hook for for disclosing any material information mm. to investors. That that has not changed. What has changed is the appetite for disclosure. 
ESG within ESG reports. We should and probably break down for the people structure. that may be less experienced yeah. what oh, is yeah, ESG. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. What public, public disclosures? Could you just go over quickly yes. on what they what okay. That is? Okay, so just in case so people, we'll li- if people are listening, I, we say we're saying <laughs> words. We shouldn't. Okay, so ESG, <laughs> environment or social and go- governance. Yeah. <laughs> when you hear that, sometimes you'll hear CSR, corporate yeah. responsibility, yeah. right? Yeah. Or two. So if you think about environmental, social, and and, and governance disclosure, basically what you're talking about is. For public organizations and some private organizations will disclose, you know, in, in their environmental damage or, or or benefit that they are providing mm-hmm. to to outside to outside stakeholders. It may also be um, uh, they they also might disclose how their products are produced um, as well. So is is the coffee fair trade is a really nice example for uh, for for that work. Simple one, yeah. and then governance. That's where the HR folks come in, I think, really heavily is how do you govern the organization from the board down to ensure that you're creating value for your investors? Yeah. So more and more, there there are there's more HR data being disclosed today than there ever really has been. Um, and if you when you talk to the to the folks that really understand prior eras of financial disclosure. It's the same story, different topic. So this, there's a gentleman out of um, out of Harvard, Bob Eccles, who was really the father of a lot of modern disclosure in the finance from a financial and an ESG um, combination. And he's literally shown parallels of what's happening today to uh, the original 10K disclosures in like in the early uh, 19th century. <laughs> Type of uh, type of thing, to, or twentieth century too, like that that type of the, those. It's very related. How's that? Link, um, how does that link with your work that you do with the team? More more of what we do is related in two ways. One is we're responsible to help tell the story and make sure that we have the clean measures to expose to uh, to the outside world. Mm-hmm. And the second is making sure that we understand the root causes statistically of how we got there. And if we're unsatisfied with the result, um, how do we change it? Nice. It really it like if if you think about um HR and kind of people data today, you could almost draw like a bullseye around it. So on the outer on the outer perimeter um is what we're what what we've disclosed to the outside world, what you disclose to the board, what you work mm. with your leadership your your executive leadership team on, what you work with employees on. And you know how you, how do you really hit the target? We've linked them all together, so you can actually have a, a consistent a consistent story all the way down. It's it's something that I was not expecting in 2023 to be working through quite yet. It kind of popped, I think, a little earlier than sure. than anyone was really doing. But it's it's a um, it's a very interesting addition. What what what? How do you see this? How do you see this evolving in the future? Um. If I were to guess, I would guess that the way that we see a 10K today Mm. will probably um, look like a lot of ESG reporting 10 years from now. Okay. You know, more transparent um, understanding of what's going on. But in practical, um, in practical ways, so internally, you can actually produce it and externally, that'll actually help to drive a decision. My guess is that some of the things that are being disclosed just generally Love don't it. drive decisions. Some do because we're, uh, I think we're all learning the language. Love it. it. Last question, we before I let you go, I've got one more question, which I've never even asked anyone, but it just came to my head. <laughs> um, what's one thing that people analytics or, or leaders aren't, are not talking about enough, but they really should be. Hmm. Hmm. Um, a good question i i think we can do a better job at linking big picture strategy with people strategy fully driven by data so you know kind of creating automatic systems so that you can you can insights are automatically generated. We talked about you know kind of GPT now coming into mm-hmm. coming into the, the to the forefront right before the before we started too. There's a there's a next generation vision I think for where HR can go um, and where an organization can go leveraging data 
that's just being formed now. Um, I'd like to see a lot more effort and energy yeah. um, articulating what that what that new world looks like. The organizations are capable of vast change quickly, and I think the skills theme that's going on right now is a good example. Yeah. Three years ago, most organizations were were not really far ahead when it comes to skills. And today, you can have a conversation with someone that said, we've actually gone to a full skills strategy. Yeah. That's pretty unprecedented. I think we could do the same thing with, with a lot of automated decision-making now, still keeping the personal touch, like where our people and their, in, and their inspiration and engagement, that's part of, of what we do. Um, but we, I think we can serve the company in an even better way. Yeah. We just need to make sure we bring you guys in on the early on the journey. Yeah. I think yeah, that yeah. tends to be, here's a strategy. Then we bring in the people on yeah. the next team. No, they sh- you mm. should be involved from the very... It's a great, very- it's a great point. And on, on that note, if, if you're working in a company that has a, com- a corporate strategy entity, mm. um, if you haven't already... Uh, became become great partners with them. Exactly. Do that today. Yeah, exactly. Do that and today. There are cor- corporate strategy partners for us. There, there's some of our. We we love working together because they're also very curious and they love to create change. And so a lot of times the the, the our values are very aligned. Love it. Um, before I let you go, um, where can people reach you if they want to reach out, say hi, and uh, yeah, and connect? Absolutely. With you? Yeah, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm I'm usually on on there. That maybe not the the fastest, but. Um, <laughs> And uh, so we, if you're interested in uh, in meetup type of stuff too, there's something called the New York Analytics Meetup. Um, just find it on on meetup.com and we try to meet a few times a year. Nice. And for, as always, for everyone listening, those links will be below. So if you're in New York, make sure you go and meet up, go and connect to be, you know, make the time. I know you're always like, Chris, I'm too busy. Ah, you, this is, a, it's, if you're too busy, that means you sh- definitely should be going to, to the meetup so yeah. to figure out why you're so busy and also network with others and yeah. obviously go and connect with Jer- Jeremy on uh, LinkedIn but um, thanks for joining I loved, I enjoyed the conversation and um, really excited to hopefully see you in soon as well when we're in New York so oh that's awesome yeah, good luck you. with that but, thanks um, for having me yeah wish you all the best until next week thanks you too